Hey everyone, today we're going to be talking about symmetry and twinning in crystals and Miller indices of mainly planes, but we'll talk about what really Miller indices are in general and how you can figure out a Miller index of a plane and why that matters for crystallography or mineralogy in general as well. So we'll talk about that today and we'll start with symmetry. There are four symmetry operations that I'm going to be focusing on for this video. These include mirrors, rotation axes, centers of symmetry or inversions and roto inversion axes. First, we have mirrors. Mirrors are relatively simple because we use mirrors every day and we kind of understand what it would mean if something had a mirror plane of symmetry. Basically, it's exactly what it sounds like. It means that there's a plane that you can pretend goes through that object or molecule or crystal. And on either side of that plane is the mirror image of the other side. So pretty simple with mirrors. There's also rotation axes. And as we're going through these, you can see there are little symbols or letters that just denote what symmetry operation we're talking about. And for example, mirrors are shown by M and then rotation axes are shown by RN. R would be denoting that it's a rotation axis. And then the N would be the number, for example, like three for a threefold rotation axis. So so what that means is just that the rotation axis, so this line or axis that you can put through this hole going into your computer and back out at you, that's the axis direction. This object can be rotated around that axis. And if it looks the exact same three times after a full 360 degrees of rotation around that axis, then that is a threefold rotation axis, so R3. However, if this was something that only looked identical twice along that entire 360 rotation, then it would be a twofold rotation axis. So another example in which we can see both mirrors and rotation axes is this equilateral triangle. Now for mirrors, we have one that goes up and down here. We can see that this equilateral triangle has a mirror image um, on either side of that mirror plane. So that would make that a mirror plane going through your computer and back out at you. That's the plane. Again, mirrors are planes and axes are just like a pole type thing. Then you have another mirror plane going in both the other directions that split the triangle basically in half. And then you have a threefold rotation axis going through just like it was through this propeller fan going through the middle or center of this triangle along the same direction as that mirror plane is. So that's the axis and that is also threefold. I promise we're going to get to non-threefold rotation axis examples in a second. The other thing I want to point out with this triangle, though, is that the book I'm using is just kind of looking at this as though it's 2D, two-dimensional, and not really thinking of what the three-dimensional symmetry operations would be if they were all considered. For example, if this triangle was somewhat thick to the point that it was 3D, you could theoretically have a mirror plane that is in the plane of your computer computer screen that splits the triangle along that plane and either side is a mirror image of the other side. So that could be another mirror plane. That's always one to consider that is easy to forget is the one along the plane you're looking at when you look at your piece of paper. Now there are exceptions. For example, this propeller fan here might not have that mirror plane that goes along the plane of your screen because it looks like it's got concave uh, fan flaps. What are those called? I don't know, but it's, it's concave on one side and convex on the other, each one of these little thingies. And this concavo convex shape is why you can't have that mirror plane going in the plane of your computer screen. So next, we just look at this example over here to the bottom right. What we have shown here are rotation axes, and they are twofold rather than three. So what we can see, for example, this one that goes up and down through the center of this crystal 
angle here shows that if it were to rotate around that axis for a full 360 degrees, it would only be an identical image twice throughout that entire 360 degrees. And the same thing goes for the other two rotation axes that it could rotate around. Then we also have vertical and horizontal mirrors. The vertical mirrors are exactly how they sound. They're just vertically going through the crystal based on how it's oriented. And the horizontal ones are going through the crystal in the horizontal direction. So that's pretty self-explanatory. And the centers of symmetry, for example, can be shown using block crystal models, which a lot of mineralogy labs have. Basically what you can do to see if something has a center of symmetry is lay one of these on a table down flat on any face and then observe whether the face that's facing down or on the table is identical in shape and size to the face that's facing upward on the exact opposite side. So for example, this green one here would have a center of symmetry, this yellow one, even this one that's slanted has the same face on the table as is facing upward toward the sky. And so basically this is saying that every face that has a center of symmetry has an equivalent parallel face on the opposite side. This is also known as inversion because if you were to invert or flip the crystal along that center of symmetry or around that center of symmetry, I don't want to say around because you're not rotating it, you're just flipping it, you're inverting it. If you were to invert it, it would be the same structure as the original structure. So I hope that makes sense. Then roto inversion axes are if you can rotate and invert the object and it comes out the same. And so these can also have an in or a number of like twofold, threefold, etc., depending on the same things that the rotation axis number depended on. So for example, if you were to rotate your object around a rotation axis 180 degrees and then invert it, it along the center of symmetry and you got the same structure out of that, then that would be a twofold roto inversion axis because you are doing 180 degrees. So it's just the same as rotation axis. So if you could do it every 120 degrees, it would be threefold, etc. So I want to talk briefly about twinning crystals and we'll talk way more about this and show more examples when we get into more of the specific chapters on a minerals and metamorphic minerals and sedimentary minerals and looking at them under thin section and telling them apart and all of this stuff. So don't worry if you're looking for examples, they're coming. We're just going to talk about how twinning works, what goes on, what types of twinning there are, and then we'll move to Miller indices. So if you don't know what twinning minerals or twinning crystals really means or what it would look like, basically down here in this middle figure, you can see some crystals that all have basically two different grains that are either crossing each other or intergrowing with each other and are symmetrical in some way. This is because the way in which twinning occurs in minerals or crystals is by symmetrical intergrowth of two or more crystals of the same substance. So twinning is with two crystal grains of the same mineral and always has some sort of symmetry associated with it. And whatever element of symmetry is associated with the twinned crystals that wouldn't be present if it was just one single crystal grain or if there was no twinning going on, that symmetry element is therefore called a twin element. And twin elements can be mirror planes, so a twin plane as listed here. It can be an axis or multiple axes, so twin axes. And then it can also be a center of inversion or symmetry, so twin centers. So this is the terminology when we look at the new symmetry element that the twinning of these two crystals added to that object as a whole or that crystal grain. We can see an example of a twin plane in this figure down here to the bottom left. We have a mirror plane here denoted with M and that separates these two mirror images of one another of this crystal grain or double crystal grain or twinned crystal grain, whatever you want to call it. And then we have an example over here of a twin axis. So a C axis or a rotation axis around which 
change the second crystal grain or twinned crystal grain will rotate around and then be intergrown with the other crystal grain and that symmetry element was not there before the crystal was twinned with another crystal grain and twinned or twinning crystals or crystal grains can be classified into three main groups these include contact twins penetrated twins and multiple twins contact twins are when the two crystal grains are separated by a twin plane so a mirror plane and penetrated twins are like the example we showed with the rotation axis example so this twinning crystal has rotated around that rotation axis and penetrated the other crystal and so these twins are classified as penetrated twins and multiple twins just means there's three or more crystal grains involved with the twinning going on and i don't actually have an example of that shown here but like i said there will be more examples of twinning minerals and how they look in thin section and hand samples and all of that in later mineralogy videos when we go over the specific examples of minerals and rocks. So now we can move on to planes, which is where Miller indices will come into play. And so we'll talk about that in a second. But first, you guys all remember when I talked about cleavage planes in one of the first mineralogy videos where I talked about how many minerals have crystal structures that make the planes in which they break along pretty easy to predict because their crystal structures or atoms are arranged in a certain way that some bonds along some planes are weaker than others and therefore the crystal will break along those planes those are called cleavage planes and we don't need thin sections to really see this we can see a hand specimen example down here at the bottom right which shows this shiny surface along which material from that mineral sample has broken off and that is because it's a cleavage plane and this can be shown here in a b and c of this figure when we look at these block like models of what would be layers of atoms really but we also notice that on each one of these little planes we have this little 010 in parentheses here now what does that mean well those are miller indices which are basically how we classify planes of a crystal structure and they can become useful when you are trying to determine what mineral you're looking at but we'll get into that later first let's talk about how how we can even arrive at one of these Miller indices. But before we jump right into it, we do need to talk about how a crystal lattice is structured, what a unit cell is, and what these little symbols inside of this unit cell shown here mean. Basically, a unit cell is the smallest repeated unit in a crystal lattice. And if you take that out and put it over here, you can also add axes to it and edge lengths labeled A, B, and C and angles labeled alpha, beta, gamma. And with those, you can even classify the minerals into seven main crystal classes or crystal systems, which I went over in the crystal system song video. If you want to watch it, I'll link it up here. But basically these axes will become important later as we try and figure out how to determine the Miller indices for planes. Now the Miller indices shown down here are in brackets. That means that that's a Miller index for a direction or vector, not for a plane. So when we're talking about planes, we put it in parentheses, not brackets. If you're talking about a direction, you put it in brackets. We're going to be talking about planes. So getting right into it, Miller indices are the reciprocals of the fractional intercepts, which the plane makes with crystallographic axes. So that's uh, great, but what the heck does that sentence mean? So down here to the bottom left, we have this plane shown on these A, B, and C axes. Now, if we look at this plane, we can see that it intercepts the A, the B, and the C axis at a certain point that we can then numerically define based on the length of A, B, and C that we know. And then if we take the reciprocal of that numerical value, you for that intercept, we can then put those reciprocal numbers into the HKNL format, aka the A intercept reciprocal, the B intercept reciprocal, and the C intercept reciprocal, respectively, in those parentheses. And that's how we come to these 010 and 110, 111, 
again, all of those three number definitions for those planes, that's how we come to that. Now I'm going to go over examples and practice on the next couple slides. So we're going to get plenty of practice if that makes zero sense to you. I get it. Miller indices were not my thing when I first learned them. So examples, I'm going to go slowly over a few examples on this slide. And then on the next slide, we're going to go over some examples where I cover up the answer while we're looking at the intercepts, just so you can think about it and decide for yourself what you think it is. And then I'll show you and hopefully that will help with you understanding how to do this on your own. So over here to the top left, we have this first example of a 111 plane. So what the heck does that mean and how do we come to that? So we have the intercepts, which is the first thing you want to do when you're trying to find a Miller index is look for what the intercepts are on the A, B, and C axes. Now this doesn't have A, B, and C labeled, which is really annoying, but it doesn't really matter because the Miller index we come out with is the same number for all the axes. So basically all you have to realize here is that the cube or unit cell has a plane in it that goes to the edge of the cube on every single axis. We call this edge numerical value one. So if it goes all the way to the edge of your unit cell, that is going to be one. That's the intercept at which it crosses that axis is at one. And it goes to one here and it goes to one here. And so all those intercepts are one. And then you have one, one, one. So what do you do with that? You take the reciprocals. You can't just put the intercepts into the parentheses. That's not the Miller index. You take the reciprocals. But in the case of this specific Miller index, you could just get away with not doing the reciprocals because all the reciprocals are the same. One over one is always going to be one. So then you come out with one, one, one anyway. And that ends up being your Miller index for this plane. But what if we have an example where the plane does not go all the way to the edge of your unit cell on two of the axes? So what we have here is unfortunately another example where they don't define the axes as A, B, and C, but we can pretty much figure out how they defined these axes by looking at the answer for the Miller index that they have. Basically for the A, they came out with a two. And if we go backwards and take the reciprocal of that, we get one half. That is the intercept we started out with. That is because the intercept along whatever they're defining as their A axis, it has to be one of these two, only goes to one half of the unit cell length rather than the full unit cell length. So it is half rather than one. Then we have a one, and that means that this direction to the right is our Y axis, because in this direction, we see that it does go to the edge of that unit cell, therefore has a value of one, which the reciprocal of one is one, and that ends up being one. And then the last axis C, which is typically the vertical axis, goes to one half where it intercepts that axis just like it did the A axis, therefore is one half and the reciprocal of one half is two and that would be a two. So that plane is defined as two, one, two in its Miller index. The last example I want to give before moving on to the practice slide is this one zero zero plane because we already saw a lot of examples that had a lot of zeros. So how would you ever come up with a zero? In this example, if we try and figure out the intercepts, we can start with A or X, which is going to be our arrow coming out toward us. This plane, this pink plane here, intercepts the A or X axis at one. So that is our normal one, which ends up being one after you take the reciprocal anyway. So that's one. And that's how we got this first number in the Miller index. However, for the next axis, we can look at the B or Y axis access going out to the right in this direction, it doesn't seem to be intercepting that axis in particular. However, it's parallel to it. When it is parallel to that axis, we put infinity. And when we take the reciprocal of infinity, we get one over infinity and we get zero for that value. The same thing happens for this plane along the Z or C axis. This axis is parallel to the plane or the plane is parallel to the axis. And in that case, we put infinity and then one over infinity is zero. And that is how we get the one zero zero Miller index and anything else with zeros in it. It's just parallel to the axis. So now I want to do some practice. And in this case, I'm going to be keeping the answers covered up as we look at the intercepts and try and figure it out that way without having the answer in front of us first. So if we start by looking at this one down here to the middle left, this is our first one. We have our axes, which are labeled weird, sorry. Normally they do A, B, C, but in this case, they're doing A1, A2, A3. Same concept, we go in that order. So for our first number in our Miller index, we're looking along the A1 axis for that intercept. What we see is that it 
intercepts the A1 at 1. Then it is parallel to the A2 and A3. Therefore, we have 1, infinity, infinity. Therefore, if we take the reciprocals, we get 1, 0, 0. And that's our answer. The second one is a similar concept. The A1 and A3 axes are parallel to the plane. However, the plane now intercepts the A2 at 1. So the intercepts would be infinity, 1, infinity. Therefore, it would be 0, 1, 0 if we take the reciprocals. Same concept for the third plane here in green. We have this plane at the top here, which intercepts the A3 axis at 1, but the other two are parallel to it. Therefore, they're infinity. So that would be infinity, infinity, 1, or 0, 0, 1. Then moving down to the bottom left, we have the A1 intercept at 1 along this blue plane, then the A2 at 1 as well. But then the A3 axis is again parallel to this plane. Therefore, we would have 1, 1, infinity, or 1, 1, 0. Moving to the purple, we have A1 intercept at 1. The A2 axis is parallel, and the A3 at 1. So that would be 1, infinity, 1, or 1, 0, 1. Then we have the pink one here, same concept. We have A1 parallel this time, and A2 and A3 are at intercepts of 1. So that would be infinity 1, 1, or 0, 1, 1. So moving up to this peachy orange color up here, this plane is a little wonky in my opinion, as are the next two we'll go over. And I don't fully understand them, but I've understood them enough to memorize what they would be. And I'm going to tell you guys about them. But from a purely, this is what it would be if this is the case standpoint, not this is why it's this, because I don't understand why. <laughs> that sounds weird, but you'll understand in a second why I'm confused. And if anybody understands this better than me, feel free to comment down below. That would be a great help. So in this peachy plane here, we have this origin intercept along the A1 axis. So that is actually, for some reason, we call it negative one rather than like zero. So it's negative one. I'll show you in a second what a symbol for that would be in the Miller index. But then the A3 axis is another one that makes somewhat sense. That one's parallel to the plane. So that would be infinity and end up being zero. However, the A2 axis here is weird. You would think it also would be intercepting at the origin and therefore negative one, but it's not. It is actually one for reasons I don't fully understand. I remember it in the way that the plane goes out to the one position of the A2 axis, but just on the other side of that cube face. So that's kind of how I remember how to look at this on a cube and know what this plane would be. And in that case, it would be negative one for the A1, which is just one with a bar over it, and one for the A2 and zero for the A3, which I understand the first and the last one. The middle one, not so much, but the same concept for the next two. We have this green plane here, kind of hard to see, but it's this plane going down from this edge to this A2 edge, and it's parallel to the A2, making the A2 zero, which we understand is because it's infinity, it's parallel, and the A1 is intercepting at the origin, and the A3 also would seem like it's intercepting at the origin, but it's a not. Instead, it's intercepting at the one position, which is actually over here, so I don't know why that happens again, but again, we would call that a one. So it would be negative one, zero, one. The same concept for this third one over here. I'm just going to show it to you because I don't understand it. I wish I did. wish I could help you guys more, but I just want to give you as many examples as I can, regardless of whether I understand them. So we have this plane over here, same concept, parallel to the A1, therefore the zero. We have the negative one for A2 because it's intercepting the origin. And then we have the one for A3 because um, we don't know. <laughs> so then moving to this blue one down here, these planes can be shown in two different places in the cube or unit cell, but they're the same definition in terms of their Miller index. Uh, basically, if we look at A1, it intercepts at one, A2 intercepts at one, and A3 intercepts at one, and that is a one, one, one plane like we talked about earlier. We also have this purple plane or family of planes over here. Basically, we have the A1 intercept at negative one, so one with a bar over it. We have A2 at 
at one and a three at one. And we can see that shown here. Now, it may seem a little weird now that we have two planes and the negative one thing is probably still confusing to you. So I'm going to show you this figure here that I showed earlier, but didn't explain just to kind of try and get you to visualize that negative one a little bit easier. Basically, when we look at an actual crystal structure on an axis that is in 3D, rather than just putting the planes within a cube, we can see the negative part a little better. So we have this origin in the center of this crystal here. We have the positive directions shown by positive signs going out to the right, up to the vertical and out towards us. And then the negative positions going out to the left, down to the bottom of your screen and back into the screen for a one. So then if we look at the planes, we can see that this red plane is all positive one, 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 because it is going out toward the one intercept of all three axes. So it's positive in all directions. Whereas this plane back here, which is actually similar to our pink one here, is going positive along the A1, positive along the A3, but in the negative direction along the A2. Therefore, it's positive one, negative one, and positive one. And that's way easier to see in the three-dimensional models of these crystals rather than these intercube plane-like models. So I just thought I'd show that. We can look at another example. For example, this orange plane down here, which has the same Miller index as this orange plane example over here in the cube. And we can look at this plane and see it goes in the positive direction at A1, so positive one. It goes in the positive direction of A2, so positive one. And then it goes in the negative for A3 as it goes down, and that's why it's negative one for that axis. And then our last two examples I'll show here are basically another couple families of planes, but they don't have any negatives, so they're a little simpler. We have an intercept at one for A1. We have a parallel situation for A2. We have a one half intercept going on for A3. And that would mean we have one infinity and one half. And if we take the reciprocals of those, we get one, zero, and two. So that's one, zero, two. And we can see that here. Lastly, we have this purple situation over here. We have an origin intercept for A1. So negative one, a parallel situation for A2. So infinity or zero zero, then a one half intercept again for a three. So two, and that is negative one, zero, two. Oh my God. I think I just understood as I was making this lecture, why these three up here were weird. Oh, this comes back to defining your origin. It makes so much sense now. So I'm going to try and explain this as best I can, but as I am just now understanding it, I might not do that. So we'll see. But these planes are basically positioned in this cube and the origin is defined as this little corner down here. But if we're defined, Defining the origin as negative one for a one, if you were to move that origin to the zero position, the plane would then intercept the one position of the a two, like we have it as defined as. And same thing for the one positions over here that we didn't understand. Basically, because we're defining that as negative one, everything shifted. And that's why it seems like the intercepts for the ones that are positive ones are shifted. And that's because they are shifted to accommodate that negative one intercept. And if you were to move it toward the origin, it would then become a one intercept at that A2, or in the case of these two, the A3 axes, it would become that one intercept. So we just can't visualize it when the origin is defined as negative one. I hope that makes sense. It's just shifted, but it makes sense because when you look at actual families of planes that are defined as one Miller index, the values look like they should be the right values when you have the origin defined as such. However, if you were to move up to this plane, which is the same orientation and therefore same Miller index, it doesn't look like it intercepts a three at one half anymore. However, it's still denoted with a two. So you would have to move the origin up so that the one half distance would still define that plane. So it all depends on your origin, guys. Maybe I just messed up that whole thing just to, on purpose to make you guys understand that the definition of the origin matters. But I wish I did because I'm just not that smart. <laughs> so before I leave you guys, I want 
to talk a little bit about why Miller indices matter because you've probably gone through this whole video and you're like, okay, fine. Like I get that this plane is these three numbers and blah, 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 blah. But why does it matter? It doesn't make sense for me to study this if it isn't going to end up mattering. So what I want to talk about on this slide is a little bit about why these do matter. And I started to mention this earlier. Basically, I said that Miller indices matter when it comes to identifying minerals and it does, but mainly when we use x-ray diffraction. Now, this is because when we talk about these planes, we're talking about planes going across unit cells at certain orientations. And when we talk about unit cells, we're talking about a small repeatable pattern in a crystal or mineral lattice that we can then define using despacing. The despacing is just spacing between planes of atoms in a mineral lattice, so the length of a unit cell basically. And this despacing can be determined if we know the Miller index of the crystal plane. And like we mentioned earlier, that is defined by three numbers in parentheses, that is H, K, and L. And if you then plug in H, K, and L of your Miller index into certain equations, which I know this looks scary, but we're going to talk about this and break it down in a separate video. Um, but I'm not going to go into all the math. Basically, there are equations you can use to plug in your H, K, and L values and determine your D spacing value for the spaces between the planes of atoms in your mineral lattice, depending on the crystal system. So the seven crystal systems we talked about or that I sung about in that song, cubic or isometric, tetragonal, hexagonal, rhombohedral or trigonal, orthorhombic, monoclinic, and triclinic, those seven crystal systems each have a unique equation that you can plug H, K, and L into to determine D spacing. And this D spacing value or D also shows up in Bragg's law. And if you were to use Bragg's law to determine your D value or D spacing value, you could actually kind of go backwards instead of knowing your mineral and knowing your Miller index of the plane and the mineral address you're looking at, you could actually use the D spacing to determine that and therefore identify not only the planes that are present in your mineral or crystal lattice, but also the mineral itself. You can use this for mineral identification. And how can we use Bragg's law to determine our D value? Well, it all comes down to x-ray diffraction. When we use x-ray diffraction to bounce x-rays off of our minerals, we can get a wavelength value for our x-ray, which we can plug into this equation and a theta or the angle between the x-ray and the mineral surface. So these values can be determined when using x-ray diffraction. And that is something we're going to be talking more about in one of the upcoming mineralogy videos. I don't know if it's going to be the next one. We'll see um, when we talk about Bragg's law and interpreting x-ray diffraction peaks. And as you can see, we have Miller indices shown on these peaks. So Miller indices will show up again there. And if you want to know how they relate to x-ray diffraction peaks and how we can use them to identify minerals, you're going to have to go and watch that video. So that will be one of the upcoming mineralogy videos along with optical mineralogy. Now I think optical mineralogy is going to be broken up into two videos. So I'm going to have the first part coming out soon, hopefully. And these are the upcoming videos. So that is it for today's video. I hope you guys liked it and learned from it, even though I clearly didn't understand everything that I was trying to teach you guys. I'm trying my best. And as for the upcoming videos, you can probably tell that the Herman Mogwin notation has been taken off the upcoming video list until further notice because guys, I just couldn't, I couldn't understand it. And I'm trying. So until I get another textbook that maybe explains it better, or I read more online that explains it better, that's going to be on the back burner for video topics. So I apologize if that's something you really wanted to learn from me. I just, you know, I'm in the same boat as you. I'm trying to learn about these things so I can relay them back to you. And some things I know a lot more about and understand better and some things I just don't. So hopefully these up coming videos will give you guys some information that hopefully you're looking for. Anyway, as I ramble on, I realize I've been filming forever for this video, so I will end it here. Thanks again for watching. I'll see you guys next time. <laughs> Bye. That was a weird explanation, but I hope you get it. Mineralogy terminology. Oh, that was so cute. Mineralogy terminology.